Greetings, adventurers. You're listening to The Quiet Journeys of Professor Atwood with me, Professor Atwood. I'm glad you're here, and I can't wait to tell you about my latest journey. Don't worry, it's a safe space. I'll handle all the danger for you. I designed these stories to help you relax, chill anxiety, and go to sleep. Maybe they'll even put a smile on your face, even if it's a sleepy smile. So please, settle in, relax, and prepare to quietly drift off with me to parts known, unknown, and even some places in between. Comfortable? Very well. Let's get underway. Good evening, adventurers. I hope you're doing well. As you remember, we were all set to watch my friend Benny and Alice get married on his secret vacation island over the holidays when things took a bit of a turn. That turn centered on a specific wedding tradition that was accidentally broken when Alice saw herself in the mirror with her wedding dress on. Luckily, there was an out and she needed one more accessory to counteract the supposed bad luck. Unfortunately, she was fresh out, so we needed to find one ASAP so the wedding could transpire as planned. I felt bad for both of them, but especially for Benny, as I'm sure he was feeling a bit helpless back in his Cape Cod home on his secret vacation island, as his fiancée Alice would not let him come along on this adventure as she wanted everything to be a surprise at the wedding. A wedding that was dependent upon our success. So he was probably feeling a bit anxious right now, and I pictured him playing his washboard very earnestly to reduce stress. I had said before it was going to be a Christmas wedding, but then it moved to a New Year's wedding, but honestly, I wasn't sure how things were going to play out as it was dependent upon the acceptance of a suitable wedding dress accessory by Alice, who was, self-admittedly, very particular. So the resolution was out of everyone's control but hers. However, I promised to do everything I could to help get her there, as did Bradley, Dolores, and Byron, our former hidden pirate. We had all accompanied Alice to the pirate lounge on the other side of the island. But that's where things went in an unexpected direction. We started looking in the pirate lounge at the far side of the secret island, but despite all the sparkling pirate booty, Alice couldn't find anything there she fancied. Luckily and unexpectedly, Byron found a hidden door which led to the underground market. After navigating a very long-lasting and still active ban on pirates in the underground market, we were ready to shop for an accessory for Alice. Now, I don't really like calling in favors or reminding people of help I provided in the past, but sometimes I have to, to move things forward for the good of the adventure. I convinced the concierge Evan to allow Byron access to the market under my supervision, of course, and he reluctantly agreed, since I had, well, saved the market from collapse a while back. And I will tell you all about our search for the perfect accessory in a moment. But first, I need to tell you about a few things. First, I'd like to nudge you to rate the show with a bunch of stars. Reviews are great too, but ratings with stars will awaken the sleeping algorithm. That algorithm will then start pushing the show to all the people who may not know about it and may need it so they can discover it. So it's all important for sure. So please rate the show and add some stars. If you want to add a review too, that's extra great as well. It's always nice to read pleasant things about what we're doing over here. Thank you, adventurers. Now it's a new year, and before I mention the White Cat Adventures Club, I want to talk about something new. Some of you may not want a membership subscription, but still want to help the show. I get it, and I understand. So we've created a one-time Science and Adventure Helper donation link on the homepage. So just go to whitecatentertainment.com and click Donate for a one-time donation. 
then you can do it whenever you like for whatever you like. You want to drop $20 every few months? Or if you just want to donate one time or once a year, that's all up to you. Every bit of science and adventure help, well, helps. But if you do want more, there's the White Cat Adventurers Club. How about early access sometimes? And ad-free listening to all the shows and an exclusive look at my very um, uh, I, it's semi, semi-weekly, kind of semi-monthly, whenever I get around to it type journal. You could read about uh, my adventures in the Everglades, along with some unusual alligators and um, a ghost encounter off of a train off the coast of California. There's been a lot of interesting things that have happened that I have not actually talked about on the show. And at the $10 tier, you can even get some soundscapes and some graphic novels periodically. $20, you can get a t-shirt. So all you have to do is go to patreon.com slash whitecatentertainment and enjoy the access your way. Now, let's get back to the story. We were just finishing up a lovely lunch in the underground market. Eben had treated us to all the underground market delicacies and all of the wonderful earthy flavors, and my new favorite, other than the chicken skewers, of course, was now the underground market signature mushroom risotto. It was so good, it tasted like the mushrooms had no other purpose other than to be paired with risotto. Eben added that it was his favorite, too. Byron also agreed, and Eben's smile faded ever so slightly. Well, I mean, hundreds of years of pirate distrust was not going to go away after one lunch, unfortunately. Eben then told us about the history of the jewelry exchange in the underground market. It was the only place you could get jewelry from all over the world, including underground market exclusives. Medieval merchants would bring jewels and trade with Far East merchants, but they would both then trade with the Lost Earthers, who had a unique and proprietary process of refining commercium to not only make it shine and sparkle like the finest diamonds, but to also, of course, nullify its transportative properties so no accidental commercium wormhole corridors opened up at an inopportune time involving the gift-giving of jewelry. However, eventually the Lost Earthers kept to themselves, or occasionally visited in secret, until recent events where I helped them deal with an unusual underground dragon to save the underground market. Now, it seemed the Lost Earthers are now visiting more frequently and out in the open, and even King Cecil occasionally makes an appearance. Eben added that new jewelry has begun to appear in the underground market jewelry exchange, so the timing to look for a wedding accessory couldn't be better. We all smiled with relief at the news and hoped things would go smoothly from that point on. Well, they didn't, but more on that later. We finished up lunch with a whipped earth pudding with dark chocolate on top. Another earthy delight, but by then we were quite full. Eben motioned for us to follow him to the underground market jewelry exchange. As we walked, we once again took in the sights sounds, and smells of the underground market. Customers haggled with stall owners, well, just for fun, as there was a haggling optional policy in the underground market. Customers shopped for everything from clothing to delicious food to unique toys to rare edition books. It was the first time there for the others, and I smiled as I saw them take another look around as eager and excited patrons milled about the stalls manned by joyful sellers. I once again marveled at the ornate and magnificent architecture. There was marble and carved stone, mosaics, and of course, fountains populating the streets and corridors. Now, the streets were some kind of high-end cobblestone in intricate patterns, with subtle color guides integrated into those patterns. That was to guide patrons to the stalls they were looking for. Eben explained to the others that each color meant something different, like green for food, blue for household items, and yellow for toys. The bioluminescent moss was everywhere on the walls and ceiling, with the mirrors shifting and positioning themselves to keep the market warm and well lit. Everything was designed to be soft and comforting, to make the shopping experience as pleasant and welcoming as possible. We soon passed the autonomous toy soldier booth, which brought back memories of the brave toy soldier who faced the underground dragon on my behalf. 
I stopped for a moment and purchased another one, as I was quite impressed with the technology, and the last one never quite made it to Bradley, since sadly it didn't survive the dragon encounter. Okay, that's not entirely true. I purchased it because I wanted to play with it as well, so I thought about it and then I ended up buying two of them, and they introduced themselves to each other as I purchased them and put them in my backpack. We were approaching the jewelry exchange, and it made me think of jewelry and its history. Jewelry consists of decorative items worn for personal adornment, such as brooches, rings, necklaces, earrings, pendants, bracelets, and cufflinks. Jewelry may be attached to the body or the clothes. From a Western perspective, the term is restricted to durable ornaments, excluding flowers, for example, and food. But, you know, that's a whole other story about an undiscovered tribe living deep in the rainforest that had a thing for plantains. It was a sign of status, and the more plantains you wore, the more respected you were in the tribe. Not unexpectedly, this led to a black market of plantain jewelry, and many desperate members of the tribe were duped into trading food and livestock for fool's plantains, which were really just bananas. Anyway, it it was a mess. Finally, they got things sorted and just agreed to all wear uncut rubies and emeralds, which seemed to be abundant for some reason where they lived. But no one knows what happened to the tribe after that. One theory has it that they cashed in and moved on, but no one is certain as they didn't really leave a note and no one could find the tribe or the rubies or emeralds again. Anyway, for many centuries, metal, such as gold, often combined with gemstones, has been the normal material for jewelry, but other materials, such as glass, shells, and other plant materials, may be used. Jewelry is actually one of the oldest types of archaeological artifacts, with 100,000-year-old beads made from uh, Nasarius shells thought to be the oldest known jewelry. The basic forms of jewelry vary between cultures, but are often extremely long-lived. In European cultures, the most common forms of jewelry have persisted since ancient times, while other forms, such as adornments for the nose or ankle, important in other cultures, are much less common. Jewelry may be made from a wide range of materials, gemstones and similar materials such as amber and coral, precious metals, beads, and shells have been widely used and enamel has often been important. In most cultures, jewelry can be understood as a status symbol for its material properties, its patterns, or for meaningful symbols. Jewelry has been made to adorn nearly every body part, and I won't elaborate on that. Interestingly, regardless of where it's worn, in modern European culture, the amount worn by adult males is relatively low compared with other cultures and other periods in European culture. The word jewelry itself is derived from the word jewel, which was anglicized from the old French jewel and beyond that to the Latin word jocale, meaning plaything. In French and a few other European languages, the equivalent term, jewelry, may also cover decorated metalwork in precious metals such as objects de art and church items, not just objects worn on the person. Humans have used jewelry for a number of different reasons. Functionally, generally to fix clothing or keep hair in place, as a marker of social status and personal status, as with a wedding ring, as a signifier of some form of affiliation, whether ethnic, religious, or social, to provide talismanic protection in the form of amulets, as an artistic display, as a carrier or symbol of personal meaning, such as love, mourning, or a personal milestone, or of course, luck. It's also considered uh, a good investment. And the last reason, superstition. Although I'm not sure why that needed a separate entry from talismanic protection, but you know, so be it. Most cultures at some point had a practice of keeping large amounts of wealth stored in the form of jewelry. Numerous cultures store wedding dowries in the form of jewelry or make jewelry as a means to store or display coins. Alternatively, jewelry has been used as a currency or as trade goods. Many items of jewelry, such as brooches and buckles, 
originated as purely functional items but evolved into decorative items as their functional requirement diminished. Eben enthusiastically brought us to the various jewelry stalls, eager and proud to show off all the variations of jewelry and settings available in the underground market. We were just blown away at the variety of the styles, sizes, and pieces of jewelry available. Now, I'm not normally a jewelry person, but there was a pendant in the form of a water molecule that did catch my eye. Eben said the underground market was the only place in the world offering sterling silver that didn't discolor immediately after wearing it, which was impressive. There was everything from diamond earrings to a full emerald tiara, and a couple of the more ostentatious pieces were displayed on a full-size mannequin with everything from a ruby mask to sapphire armbands. Now, at this point, I had to ask, uh, what about theft? With all these incredibly valuable pieces just out in the open, wasn't that a problem? Eben smiled, though he did awkwardly glance at Byron for a moment. He said there were numerous reasons theft was not a problem. The first being that the underground market was a privilege, and most people entering here understood that and adhered to the honor system. The most obvious reason was the ban on pirates. But the third was the most interesting. It turned out the Commercium had the ability to mark purchases as well as people coming in and out of the respective Commercium tunnel conduits. When a purchase was made, the Commercium authorized the purchase to leave with the customer. So if something was stolen, it could never leave the market. I was very curious as to how this was established, but Eben then smiled and said it was proprietary knowledge and he wasn't authorized to speak any more about it. I said I understood, and I felt Evan's reluctance to discuss their proprietary commercium marking security system was perhaps in part due to Byron's presence. As I said before, that wasn't going to get smoothed over in one visit. Still, Evan allowed Byron to be there under my supervision, and I suppose that was a start. I also noticed Byron didn't seem to mind the suspicion. Even when Dolores was keeping a close eye on him as we searched for Captain Kidd's treasure a while back, I suppose it came with the territory. Unfortunately, Alice was still not finding anything she liked, so the search continued. Eben introduced us to a whole section of the underground market jewelry exchange just featuring beads. As you know, beads are frequently used in jewelry. These may be made of glass, gemstones, metal, wood, shells, clay, and polymer clay. Beaded jewelry commonly encompasses necklaces, bracelets, earrings, belts, and rings. Beads may be large or small. The smallest type of beads used are known as seed beads. These are the beads used for the woven style of beaded jewelry. Seed beads are also used in an embroidery technique where they are sewn into fabric backings to create broad collar neck pieces and beaded bracelets. Bead embroidery, a popular type of handwork during the Victorian era, is enjoying a renaissance in modern jewelry making. Beading, or beadwork, is also very popular in many African and indigenous North American cultures. Unfortunately, Alice concluded that beads were not striking a chord with her either, so the search continued. Now, as I mentioned earlier, jewelry had been used to denote status. In ancient Rome, only certain ranks could wear rings, and later, sumptuary laws dictated who could wear what type of jewelry. This was also based on rank of the citizens at that time. But I don't think this was having any impact on Alice's decision. I don't think she really cared about status or rank, and neither did Benny. Cultural dictates have often played a significant role in the wearing of jewelry. For example, the wearing of earrings by Western men was considered effeminate in the 19th century and the early 20th century. Most recently, the display of body jewelry, such as piercings, has become a mark of acceptance or seen as a badge of courage within some groups but is completely rejected in others. 
Likewise, hip-hop culture has popularized the slang term bling, or bling bling, depending on how much of it there is, which refers to an ostentatious display of jewelry by men or women. Conversely, the jewelry industry in the early 20th century launched a campaign to popularize wedding rings for men, which caught on, as well as engagement rings for men, which did not, going so far as to create a false history and claim that the practice had medieval roots. By the mid-1940s, 85% of weddings in the U.S. featured a double ring ceremony, up from 15% in the 1920s. This also illustrates the power, and perhaps the misuse of power, by marketing companies. Although my daughter, Ellen, who works in marketing, may disagree. Now, the history of jewelry is long and goes back many years, with many different uses among different cultures. It has endured for thousands of years and has provided various insights into how ancient cultures worked. Now, the earliest known jewelry was actually created not by humans, well, homo sapiens, if we're splitting anthropology hairs, but by Neanderthals living in Europe. Specifically, perforated beads made from small seashells have been found dating to 115,000 years ago in the Cuela de los Aviones, a cave along the southeast coast of Spain. Later, in Kenya, at Encapune Yamoto, Beads made from perforated ostrich egg shells have been dated to more than 40,000 years ago. In Russia, a stone bracelet and marble ring are attributed to a similar age. So again, you know, this isn't a little bit of a disagreement. First it was Neanderthals, and then it was maybe a little bit later that the first piece of jewelry was found. Uh, but generally, the first piece is always found in a cave. That seems to be uh, pretty consistent. So um, I wouldn't worry too much about it. It's the point is the jewelry is old it's been used by humans and Neanderthals for many many years and later the European early modern humans had crude necklaces and bracelets of bone teeth berries and stone hung on pieces of string or animal sinew or pieces of carved bone used to secure clothing together in some cases jewelry had shell or mother of pearl pieces a decorated engraved pendant, the Star Car Pendant, dating to around 11,000 BC and thought to be the oldest Mesolithic art in Britain, was found at the site of the Star Car in North Yorkshire in 2015. In southern Russia, carved bracelets made of mammoth tusk have been found. Around 7,000 years ago, the first sign of copper jewelry was seen. In October 2012, the Museum of Ancient History in Lower Austria revealed that they had found a grave of a female jewelry worker, forcing archaeologists to take a fresh look at prehistoric gender roles after it appeared to be that of a female fine metal worker, a profession that was previously thought to have been carried out exclusively by men. So now remember, this brings us back to the first rule of science. Forget what you think you know. New evidence can change theories and conventional wisdom in a heartbeat. Anyway, as Alice kept turning down accessory after accessory, Eben smiled. He said he had just the thing. He spoke to a merchant in a nearby stall and returned shortly. Eben presented a special wedding brooch made by the Lost Earthers out of refined commercium. It shone and sparkled in the reflected light of the underground market. Alice smiled warmly, but then looked melancholy, and her smile slowly dropped. She said it was indeed beautiful, and admitted that she was quite taken by it, but it just wasn't her. She hesitated for a moment, and I could tell there was more. She slowly continued. She added that the perfect accessory should be beautiful, but more importantly, it had to reflect her and her marriage to Benny as well. And that was the crux of it. It had little to do with how beautiful the accessory was or how expensive. It had to be a personal purchase, and it had to have a personal meaning to her and Benny. Something that had significant meaning to her, Benny, and their new life together. That was a lot of boxes to check. 
Over the next few hours, Eben and the underground market jewelry exchange merchants continued to show Alice all kinds of jewelry from necklaces to bangles, all more exotic than the next, with precious stones featuring diamonds, rubies, emeralds, and everything in between. Unfortunately, it just wasn't working. As beautiful and exotic as all the jewelry was, Alice still could not find anything that spoke to her. Nothing felt personal enough. Eben added, unhelpfully, that this had never happened before in the history of the underground market. I thought for a moment, and now with this new data, had one last idea. I took Byron aside for a moment and spoke with him privately, as I had to get clarity on one hidden pirate matter. I kept Byron's answer to myself, as I couldn't reveal my final idea until we returned back to the secret beach and Benny's vacation home. Meanwhile, Alice was becoming distraught, and our hopes were beginning to fade as well. Dolores and Bradley tried to comfort her, but they didn't have much success. If the underground market didn't have anything she liked, it was doubtful anywhere else would. She was resigned to the fact that she would have to tell Benny the wedding was off. I told her not to be too hasty, as there may be other avenues to explore, but she wouldn't hear of it. She was determined not to start a marriage and a new life off on the wrong foot, and her mind was made up. We would have to start the journey back to Benny's house empty-handed. It was a defeat, for sure, and I was determined to make it a temporary one. I still had one idea left, but like I said, it would have to wait until we got back to Benny's house in Secret Beach. Would it work? Well, after speaking with Byron, I hoped it would, but there were no guarantees. Anyway, it was worth a try, and I will tell you all about it next time. But before I end this evening's story, I think we need to talk about the accessory elephant in the room. Sometimes, adventures and journeys don't quite turn out the way you expect, even when it seems everything is in your favor. The luck of finding an underground market entrance right in the pirate lounge, just when Alice needed a jeweled accessory, seemed like a serendipitous discovery. But even when things line up, they can go south. But that's not the lesson here. For any reason, things can go south. And sometimes, there's nothing you can do about it. It's how you react to the circumstances that's important. Now, I had one last idea, and it was a long shot, but I needed to be perfectly prepared for it not to work as well. That's the thing about preparation. Hope for the best, prepare for the worst. I mean, that's an oversimplification, obviously. I mean, if you're in a jungle or in a cursed temple or at the foot of an active volcano, you don't really know how bad things can get until you're there. But again, it's how you react that's important. Although it can feel like it, failure isn't an end in and of itself. What it really is, is a temporary pit stop presenting a lesson. Yes, we failed to find an accessory for Alice in the one place it would be easiest to find one. So be it. We would go back to Benny's Cape Cod and figure it out. One way or another, things would move forward and everyone would keep moving on. So don't get stuck. And understand failure isn't a hole, it's a speed bump. Keep driving. Good night, adventurers. The Quiet Journeys of Professor Atwood was created, written, and performed by Chris Mancini and produced by White Cat Entertainment. It is a work of fiction. Maybe. Music and sound design by Ron Tansky at rontanskymusic.com. For more info and merchandise, including t-shirts, mugs, and blankets, go to whitecatentertainment.com. Mm-hmm.